Hi, good afternoon. Can you guys hear me all right in the back? Am I too loud? Just absolutely perfect. Thank you. Okay, my name's Simon West. I'm CMO for SoftLayer, and I'm going to talk to you for a little while this afternoon about branding and positioning and kind of seeking out your place in a fairly crowded and competitive marketplace and uh, show a few examples. I'm going to start with a quote that's probably indiscernible from the back. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading a new book on B2B lead generation on my Kindle, because that's a sort of hedonistic rock and roll lifestyle I lead. The title of the book was Maximizing Lead Generation by Ruth Stevens, and about three or four pages in, the quote, lead generation is the single most important objective of any B2B marketing department. Other objectives such as brand building, and she goes on to list a litany of other brand-related disciplines, are also on the list to be sure, but providing a sales force with a steady stream of qualified leads is job one. And inevitably, uh, she goes on to show a table, 2010 CMO challenges, top 10 of which the overwhelming respondents generating high-quality leads, which suggests that these are CMOs that are heavily under the cost of their sales leadership, and almost all of the rest of these are lead generation. Um, and the word that comes to mind, which is an English word, is, a, is bollocks. There's a s similar term in Texas that's bovine related as well. But this seems to be the kind of prevailing wisdom, at least in IT and B2B marketing, which is that it's all about lead generation. In fact, the clear contention, the implication in the rest of this chapter, is that any work you're doing on the brand stuff, the artsy-fartsy stuff, is a luxury at best and a waste of time at worst. And I wouldn't disagree with the main premise, which is that you could probably argue that at the end of the day, the single reason for existence for marketing is to drive leads to a sales force, but in the same way that an army's single reason for existence is ultimately to shoot things and win wars, you still don't necessarily send it into battle completely empty-handed. If you're doing all of your work on tactical lead generation, if you're spending no time at all on the blocking and tackling of creating a story for your brand, creating an identity for your company, then you're going to ultimately end up as a commodity. So I have another quote here, and it's in bigger type, so it's obviously more legitimate. Philip Kotler says, if you're not a brand, then you're a commodity. Um, if you look at this, it's not to make this implication on this sample set of web banners, but this is particularly true in a very crowded marketplace. This is a collection of banners taken over about a 10-minute period on about five different websites. Apparently, green is very now if you're building ad banners. I look for green, it's clearly in fashion. There's an awful lot of uh, people in this industry, an awful lot of ad bin banners being bought, a lot of SEM work being done, a enormous competition for share of voice and share of mind. And the companies ultimately that will stand apart are companies that have built a position in the marketplace, that are telling a story, that have a core identity that is differentiated and that stands above the noise, the speeds and feeds, the prices and promotions and so on. So I want to talk a little bit today about certainly the work that we've done, both the soft layer and in my past experience, around that kind of fundamental blocking and tackling brand work. Again, this isn't to devalue the importance of lead generation, but the contention I would make is that if you do the foundational work, if you understand from an identity perspective at its core who you are as a company, who you are from a culture, a vision, a values perspective, if you have eked out and defined a solid position in the market, and if you tell that story with style, both visual style, with structure, with differentiation, then I wouldn't disqualify the rest of the discipline as just showing up, but it makes the lead generation a great deal easier. If you've got a story that people are interested in, if when you tell people who you are and what you do, they are engaged, that it is resonant, then which list to buy, which ad banner placements to place, and where to put the trade show booth relative to the bar on the trade show floor all become slightly less important details. Conversely, if you've got a brand and an identity that's nondescript, that's indistinguished, that no one really cares about, it doesn't matter how clever you are with some of this tactical stuff, with the ability to buy and place ads, with the ability to write copy, people are going to be less interested. They're going to pass you by on the show floor and look for others. So understand your identity, define your position, and ultimately tell your story, and we'll kind of whip through each of those in process. The identity piece is essentially self-explanatory. It's extremely difficult um, in an internet-enabled society with an increasingly interactive conversation around brand to pull the wool over people's eyes. If you don't fundamentally build your brand identity from your core identity as a company, 
then it's going to be implausible. It's going to be, at, at best, a difficult sell. And at worst, you're going to simply come across as disingenuous and as inauthentic. So again, this is fairly self-explanatory. You build the identity out of who you are, who you are as a culture, who your customers are, who your people are, your leadership, the values you hold as a company, the purpose you serve as a company, the vision you have as a company, because to invent a brand that is antithetical to these or contradictory to these uh, is almost guaranteed a recipe for disaster. The conventional school of thought suggests that um, the greatest, either the greatest ad Apple ever ran in the history of the company or the greatest ad that's ever been run in the history of advertising, or the greatest 35 seconds in the field of human endeavor is the 1984 Apple Big Brother IBM PC attacking ad. And I've always disagreed. I think the greatest ad that Apple ever ran was about 13 years later in 97 when they launched Think Different. Because the IBM Super Bowl ad was very compelling, it was very dramatic, it was well shot, it was highly contentious, but ultimately it was really defining Apple through what they were not. It was really a competitively positioned ad. It said very little about the company other than what it, implying what it wasn't. On the other hand, Think Different was ultimately the sum total expression of who Apple perceived itself to be as a company, as a culture. It was ostensibly about its buyers and its customers, but it was really Apple talking about themselves. And it was obviously done in a fairly high-flown manner. It takes some stones to compare yourself as an organization to Mahatma Gandhi. But it would work very, very well. They position themselves as a place for the artists, the creatives, the, the, the different thinkers, so to speak. And they were so successful in this that a few short years later, you had middle managers in regional banks in Boise, Idaho, buying PowerBook G3s and Power Mac G4s because they identified as a frustrated artist trapped in the body of a bank manager. So this was really a true expression of who they were as an, from, from an identity perspective. It's all the more remarkable that at the time, this was pre-IMAC, they were still shoveling out nondescript beige crap by the tower, right? underpowered, slightly overpriced. So it was aspirational, and I think it's okay to be aspirational and forward-looking with the brand identity, but if you don't start moving towards it in, in action, in product, in thought, then obviously it, people are not going to respond at all. And had they continued, I think, to sell just, you know, beige tower after beige tower, then it wouldn't have worked very well. But they put wood behind the arrow. They started to release product that was congruent and aligned with this concept of think different. And what they'd really done here was not invent a new identity for Apple in 97, but they'd arguably actually re-uncovered and rediscribed the core vision, the core identity with which the company was founded at its inception. So that's the identity piece. Positioning, I think, there's probably familiarity with across the room, but I'll... Um, go into a very quick survey of it. Reason Trout wrote the Bible uh, over 20 years ago. Positioning is not what you do with a product, it's rather it's what you do into the mind of a prospect by occupying a space and occupying a, a core position in the mind of the prospect. There are some classic examples uh, that are in the textbooks. Obviously, Volvo owns the position of safety around cars and has done since the 60s. Every now and then they forget about it, but when they come back to this with the core messaging and the core creative, they're always more powerful. Volvo is synonymous with safety. Harley-Davidson is synonymous with rebellion. Oracle is synonymous with pure, unadulterated evil. <laughs> Don't laugh too loud, because the eye of Ellison is. Um, three fundamental types of positioning, and you rarely go about these in a completely conscious manner. Right? No one sits down and says, we're going to establish a position for our company, we're going to go after the experiential positioning. They're also shades of grey, so few successful companies are going to position exclusively on one of these three tiers, but there's generally an emphasis. You start with functional positioning, which is certainly the majority positioning, particularly in IT and B2B. Functional positioning is essentially showing problem solving, showing the delivery of benefits to a customer base, a, a much more kind of black and white emphasis, if you will, on features and benefits. Experiential. Is almost the other end of the spectrum, which is much more concerned with the experience, with providing a cognitive, a tactile experience. And finally, symbolic is ultimately about meaning and identity, about self-image rather than product image, about belonging, about community. We look at a few, again, examples. From functional positioning standpoint, Nike is an object lesson from a consumer perspective. If you look at Nike's advertising, they are positioned very consistently around the concept of performance. Again, it's not at the expense of experiential positioning and symbolic, but they lead 
with functional positioning. If you look at the brand advertising, the products are generally in the shot, but they're not the hero of the shot, right? The hero is athletes performing incredible tasks. They are very, very strongly positioned from a functional standpoint around performance. Their German rivals, on the other hand, are much more focused on positioning from an experiential standpoint. So if you look at Puma, uh, the hero in the pro product advertising is generally the product itself. It's close up, it's highly tactile, it's really being sold from a look and feel perspective. If you look at their retail experience, their shops in high-end malls approximate high-end fashion boutiques as opposed to Nike who have taken a much more big box approach and arrange it by sport or by discipline. So a fundamentally different approach. If we belabored the shoe examples, which I haven't done because legally obviously I have to show three Apple logos every presentation, from a shoe perspective, Converse would be perhaps the best example of symbolic positioning. If you buy Nike shoes because you think they'll make you a better athlete, if you buy Puma because you think they'll look good, then you buy Converse because Joey Ramone wore them on the album cover. You're not buying them for comfort, you're just not. You're buying them because of what they suggest about self-image, right? It's an image-conscious purchase. But Apple, obviously, is the other prime example. If Think Different was fairly explicit about identification about self-image, then Mac versus PC is incredibly explicit. It literally says, I buy this product because I am this product. It's what it says verbatim. Uh, and they've been so successful in this that they've left themselves open um, to mockery. There was a Samsung ad a couple of years ago that shows a line of hipstery people lined up outside what is obviously an Apple store, and there's a couple of guys with the sat whatever the latest Galaxy, um, I have no idea what they are, I'm an Apple fanboy, big Samsung Galaxy phone, big screen, and they're going down the line showing it off, and one of the guys in the line says, I love that phone, but I couldn't possibly buy a Samsung, I'm a creative, and his mate says, dude, you're a barista, which shows you how pervasive that core think different identity and that core position of Apple as home for creatives for those who think different has penetrated. It's now actually right for satire. If we look within the industry um, from an experiential positioning standpoint, and really I would offer from a positioning standpoint in general, Rackspace has done a great job. They embraced positioning as a marketing concept in the very earliest stages of the company. They actually had the recent Trout people come in and, and do a kind of orthodox positioning exercise. It's worth remembering before they hit fanatical support as a positioning statement their advertising was fairly diverse. They tried any number of things in print media and online before they settled on this. But once they settled on this, they hit it and hit it hard. Their advertising is highly effective. I think, again, it's less effective when they take the eye off the ball and move away from the core positioning. But it's fundamentally an experiential position. It's not really about the specific problems they'll solve for support. It's about the emotive quality present in the word fanatical. Right? It's about how you'll feel as a Rackspace customer. It's fundamentally a customer service business. And in fact, you'll hear those folks talk about Nordstrom and Zappos as their spiritual brethren. Right? They're selling touch and relationship and doing it very well. Firehost, on the other hand, have taken uh, a fundamentally functional position. Right? They are positioning their cloud around the concept of security. It's very, very consistent. All of the creative, all of the primary copy on the website, the boilerplate and the PR, everything is really aligned around security. This is obviously newer to the market from a, a marketing perspective, and whether or not they can truly own that position, I don't know, but they're showing a, a admirable consistency, I think, at this point in taking it down. Uh, data return, where I started out, and this is uh, uh, the second one we'll talk about. When we started in 96, we actually positioned the company around a self-imposed limitation, which is we were Microsoft only. Right? We were business-oriented, mid-sized company, oriented, managed hosting company, but all we served was Microsoft, which in the late 90s wasn't actually necessarily the best way to secure an enormous share of the market, which was still fundamentally Unix and Linux based. But we took that and we hit it very heavily. We talked about Microsoft centricity, we talked about Microsoft expertise, we aligned the PR in favor of that, we went first to market on various products, and it worked very, very well. And by the late 90s, early 2000s, we were punching well above our weight in terms of Microsoft um, prospects and deals. We would doing a pretty good job at beating much more uh, significantly larger, much more powerful competition, the Digixes of the world, because we had become fairly synonymous with high-level Microsoft expertise. We went through about, let's call it, 63 changes of control over the next 18 months, and one of the things that happened along the way was we picked up a fairly significant expertise in Solaris, in Big Eye, in Unix, and in Linux, and to our great surprise, it turns out that Solaris sysadmins 
didn't immediately respond to our message about SQL Server expertise, so we had to try something different. What we did in the second wave of data return was orient the company around a higher level of service. Not service in the Rackspace sense in terms of touch, but a more functional positioning um, around the level of support, which at the time for data return went all the way from the operating system right through the custom application or the off-the-shelf application, which was a fair rarity at the time. So we thought we'd try and invent a category. So we branded the, or we positioned the company around the tagline of highly managed hosting, seeking, if you like, to establish a super premium category in an industry where managed was fundamentally the super premium at the time. It didn't work as anything like as successfully as the Microsoft positioning, partly because over the next three or four years, we continued to kind of expand the product set beyond the core managed hosting discipline and ultimately demoted this from a position to simply a product brand name, and partly because arguably our identity was still so tied up, even after a couple of years hiatus of the brand, with Microsoft centricity, it was actually difficult to reposition the company. At Terramark, a couple of years later, we actually tried the same gambit on a product level rather than a company level. So we launched our flagship cloud product in 2008, and there was a great deal of agonizing and gnashing of teeth about what to call this thing. It went through a variety of code names, which Colo 2.0 is the only one I haven't mercifully committed to memory. And in the end, we decided to try the same thing. We thought, well, this is a fundamentally an enterprise class cloud. It was at just about the inception of cloud being used in terms of the way we all know it now. Cloud, not just as abstract metaphor, but cloud as cloud computing as cloud infrastructure. So not being one to learn from our mistakes, we thought we'll try it again and describe the product rather than branded the product as the enterprise cloud simply as enterprise cloud. And arguably, I think this was much more successful. I think there was a great deal of luck in timing. We were able to launch this thing just at the kind of tip of the zeitgeist for cloud, or at least cloud above the EC2 developer level, cloud up into the enterprise. But the use of that term of, of enterprise cloud and the way in which we hit it fairly consistently from a marketing and description standpoint, quickly became apparent we were going to get mentioned more often than not in any news article that discussed cloud. It had the additional benefit that we just owned the SEO on it. So once people actually started to optimize and search for enterprise cloud or enterprise cloud computing on Google, we built and established long enough uh, and old enough web pages and enough consistent use of this thing that we were, I think, three of the first on the, on the front page. So a product position there rather than a, a company position, but effective perhaps nonetheless. So from a positioning standpoint, evaluate the market. It, we did with SoftLayer, and we'll get to that at the very end, uh, a fairly kind of exhaustive survey of the competitive space. It's very, very difficult to go into, uh, uh, try and attack a position that someone already owns, right? It, you're not gonna beat Volvo on the safety at this point, uh, short of some unforced error by Volvo themselves. It would be extraordinarily different to go, difficult to go after Rackspace effectively on customer service. I've tried in the past. It's, it's almost impossible because they are ubiquitous. Uh, from that position. So look for open space and find open space that is consistent and, and authentic and true and aligned with your identity. Because if you're trying to be something you're not, culturally, from a product standpoint, a feature standpoint, a reach standpoint, it's not going to be credible. And finally, alignment isn't just about aligning the identity with the position, it's also obviously about aligning the rest of the business. The product services, client services, PR, the whole thing really has to be aligned in support of this narrative or it's not going to be consistent and it's not going to be credible. So the final piece is um, the story. If we start by establishing who we are and, and what we want to be, the next piece is to simply to tell that core narrative and tell it well. I think that's a Seth Godin quote, but he gets on my nerves so I didn't attribute it. Um, I'm a huge believer here in, in keeping it simple. The simplest stories are nearly always the most affecting, and that's not just true of B2B marketing, that's true of storytelling in general. Treat this like a narrative, um, whether you're just talking about website copy, banner ads, or if you're B2B or enterprise focused and you've got the inevitable company overview PowerPoint, it's much more compelling to present that information in the form of a narrative, preferably a narrative that places the listener at the center of the story, than simply a comma delimited list of services and the inevitable demographic slide and the company logo slide. If nothing else, at least you'd be structurally different from 90% of the other PowerPoints your prospects see, uh, and therefore slightly more interesting. From a, a language standpoint, um, the buzzword bingo game is one best avoided. I, while well, I'll accept part 
complicity in this. I walked the trade show floor at Cloud Expo in Santa Clara in October, and every other booth said Enterprise Cloud or Enterprise Class. And it wasn't just service providers, it was virtualization developers, it was operating system purveyors, it was chipset manufacturers, it was cloud orchestration providers, cloud management providers, printing in the cloud providers, it, everything said enterprise class and enterprise cloud. It's just noise at that point. And some of those companies are highly credible. They have an enterprise focused product portfolio and an enterprise focused customer base. But many more are just cottoned onto enterprise class, like we all cottoned onto next generation in 2001, as just a generic imprimatur for credible. Most of these buzzwords, whether they're present in boilerplate or present in web copy or ad copy, are, are just further genericize what you're offering and just make it sound like everyone else's. I'd offer the same thing with a heavy qualifier around technical jargon. This is a fairly technical business for the most part, and it requires an appropriate level of technical terms, and some are more appropriate. Some level is more appropriate than others, depending on whether you're selling to technology sort of business people. But don't overdress it, because it's very, very easy to make it absolutely impenetrable to all but the most expert user. Um, keep it simple from a brand standpoint. Um, you may remember this uh, video spoof of what would happen if Microsoft had got hold of the iPod package back about 10 years ago. This is a really, really heavily overbranded industry, and it takes a great deal more attention, time, and resources to operate a house of brands than it does a branded house. There is a tendency to release services as well as products and to insert a proprietary brand name into every single one of them. And unless you have a very healthy marketing budget and enough traction on the core corporate brand name or enough disinterest in it that you don't have to spend any money and time on it, every dollar you spend on a product brand name is a dollar you could have spent at the corporate level positioning the company itself. Now, there are reasons to do this and do it mindfully. There are reasons to stand up half a dozen different brands if you're going after discrete industries, discrete territories, if there are legacy reasons to do it from an M&A perspective. Um, but it's worth being very mindful about it. And I speak from bitter experience, so a short anecdote. When we were with Data Return in 2005, we had a customer portal, and the customer portal was called Digital Ops. I would have put all these up, but it would have taken too long to find the logos. So we had Data Return, we had Digital Ops. We developed what was probably the first uh, to market VMware-based virtual server managed hosting offering, and we called that platform, which was basically clustered VMware with a fiber attached SAN, we called that Infinistructure, so keep up. And Infinistructure was quite a good name. It sounds sexy, it looked good on paper, it ac accurately described the kind of infinite scale we were going for, and no one from the InfiniBand people had called with their lawyers. Then we released the managed service on Infinistructure, and for reasons I blocked out, we called that MH1. So the service, as it appeared in print, was data return MH1, powered by Infinistructure, managed by Digital Ops. And for the 15 people left on the planet capable of passing that without confusion, a year later we decided to call one component of Digital Ops Infinicenter. So we had five brands. Um, and all of that was attention we could have spent either on the core Infinistructure brand and really marketed the platform itself which I would probably argue for now, or even on the core data return brand and continuing to build much needed brand awareness for the corporate brand. One of the opportunities we took when data return was merged inside of Terramark was to cut the throat of nearly every product related brand, including highly managed hosting, and to focus all of the branding either on the corporate brand itself or on areas where we thought we had significant unique IP and that smelled more like platforms and technologies and products rather than simply services. But there's no evidence to suggest that anyone's going to choose your co-location service if you call it the Colo 2000 XL versus simply co-location. It will make it more difficult to find on the website. It'll make it more in need of explanation in the first paragraph of copy or the headline, and it will make it vastly more difficult to optimize for from an SEO perspective. So I, I, in this industry, I think it's worth keeping it simple and remembering how scarce the resources are in terms of building brand for multiple or building awareness for multiple brands simultaneously. From a visual standpoint, and this is a relatively minor detail, but again, if repetition is the key to brand awareness, then keeping it visually consistent is very important. And I think here, again, it's really about simplicity and about controls. I'll invoke Apple at the risk of incurring everyone's wrath one more time. Everyone talks about Apple in terms of the sophistication of the aesthetic, but if you look at Apple from a corporate brand identity standpoint, it's actually really simple. There's not a lot there. It's a monochromatic logo. 
It's one typeface, Myriad Pro, in about three different weights, and it's based a very fundamental grid layout system. It's almost minimalist, right? There's not a lot to the corporate brand. But the consistency of that, whether it's a full color print ad, whether it's the admittedly limited manuals that you now get when you buy the computer, whether it's a four color product box, or even whether it's the one color thermal printed receipt you get from the iPhone based credit card swiper, everything looks exactly the same. It's incredibly consistent. And all you really need is a logo, a typeface, preferably one type family, preferably just a few weights, a color scheme, preferably documented so that you don't end up with 16 different reds, a basic rule set and set of principles for typographic and page layout, and a set of either your own visual assets, photography, and a, a lexicon and alphabet for icons, diagrams, and so forth, or access to a high quality stock photography library. This has got much more accessible, obviously, than it was a decade ago. The highly managed hosting ad I showed a few slides back, I think that photo of a skyscraper we paid three and a half, four grand for to take it for six months. You can now get the same photo from iStock Photo, and I think it costs a nickel. Um, in fact, if anything, at this point, on a stock photography basis and stock illustration basis, there's too much choice. So I think the rule set there, again, is get access to a couple of high-quality libraries, but limit the rule set. Limit photographic style, composition, layout, color, form. Pick a visual language and stick with it. If you get those rules in order and you document it, some of the boring stuff, the one sheets and so on, start to design themselves because you've taken much of the otherwise repetitive work of reinventing the wheel out of it, and you can just start to produce the needed assets on a fairly regular basis. Uh, follow the rule of three. So I've been searching in vain for kind of any substantial documentation about this, and none really exists. But there is ample evidence to suggest that three is a pretty good magic number when it comes to structuring narrative. Plays follow a classic three-act cycle, as do films. There's a classic three phase structure to kind of journalism, to essays and so forth. If you watch the master showman like Jobs rolling out new products, whether it was a fairly simple point in time software, whether it was an entire new operating system, typically picked three features and showed only those three features. There's a danger when presenting a broad service portfolio and boiling the ocean and trying to show every single product that you do on one slide per product and bullets that describe every feature of that product. It's really easy when you're building a demo of your cloud portal to suddenly find yourself in the 42nd minute on the third tab of the user preferences screen talking about you know, second order password encryption strengths. Pick three features and bake the hell out of the demo and show those three features. It'd be so much more compelling. We did this to a fairly literal degree at Terramar where we took a, what was at the time an increasingly broad and some might even argue semi-coherent service portfolio, and try to apply some structure to it by very literally applying the rule of three. So we took a fairly broad battery of disaster recovery, information security, managed hosting, cloud, colo, peering, interconnect, transit services together. And the narrative we structured was fundamentally to box all of that into simply three. And so the contention here was that from an operational perspective, you can divide all of IT into three fundamental areas, computing, communications, and information. And for us, as an information and enterprise-centric company, we stressed information, pointed out that at the end of the day, the other two are really means to an end. Computing is about generating, analyzing, calculating, displaying information. Communications is really in service of collaborating, sharing, transmitting, broadcasting information, but the information is at the heart of it. We used to explicitly ask in the PowerPoint for buy-in from the CIOs we were presenting to. Do you guys agree with this? And it would engage, right? Every now and then, you'd have someone go, no, which is a bit of a problem. Um, but by and large, they bought into it, and now they're interested in the structure. We really chanced our arm on the rule of threes at that point. We thought it would be um, fairly gratuitous to then divide the, each one of those components into three further components, a sort of rule of nines, if you will, but I don't necessarily recommend that level of complexity. And the final, and perhaps I think most underserved part, is, is make it resonate. Give it emotional resonance and relevance to your customer base. Rackspace, again, has done a good job here. The word fanatical isn't a quantitative word. It's a highly emotive word. It's why it's so difficult to fight, because if you can't really define what that means. Um, in fact, fanatic arguably has two or three fairly negative connotations, some of which I've tried to exploit in the past. But it doesn't matter, because people respond to it and respond to it positively. Everyone gets in um, consumer marketing the idea that 
we as humans buy stuff in our personal lives for intangible reasons as well as tangible reasons, for quantitative re qualitative reasons as well as quantitative reasons. When I buy a phone in my personal life, it's accepted that I'm not necessarily going to buy the one with the biggest screen and the fastest processor. I'm also going to buy it based on the way it feels or the way it looks or even the brand. Yet everyone conventionally in IT and B2B marketing seems to dismiss that and assumes that when we buy tech in our professional lives, we're buying it for rigorous, rigorously rational and quantitative reasons and emotion doesn't come into it. And I don't think that's true at all. If it was true, you wouldn't have sysadmins walking around in your offices with Linux tattoos. That's a Photoshop, by the way. That's not really a, someone walking around our data center floor with a Linux tattoo. But if you'd Googled Linux tattoos like I did a couple of days ago and presented with what you saw, you'd have gone to Photoshop pretty quickly as well. <laughs> so give it meaning. Emotional resonance doesn't mean that it, it, you slather on fake emotion, but give it some meaning. Give it some re make it more relevant than just feature benefit and weave that into the structure of the piece itself. So the kind of wrap-up conclusion then, understand who you are as a company fundamentally at the, at the core of it. Define your position based partly on who you are as a company and partly on an analysis of your particular segment of the market and where you think there's space to really own a position. And finally, tell that story with some style, with some panache, with some conviction and with some consistency. And I think it'll help very substantially the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling and the lead generation and the rest of the narrative. I'll close with a, just a very brief look, and by no means am I suggesting that we're at the hypothesis of this, but simply how we've put the basic principles into practice recently with SoftLayer. And if the video works, we'll show that too. Um, this is a sample, actually it's a fake kind of mock-up of, of the print advertising. But what, when I came to SoftLayer in October, the kind of first order of business was how, how should we tell this story? We told the story in a very kind of fact-based way. We'd shown the products and features and kind of let the customers come to it. And that was quite successful. In, in fact, it was a you know, $300 million worth of successful. But we wanted to describe the kind of core identity, the reason for being. And what we ended up with was uh, a tagline we kind of coalesced around called Build the Future. We said when we looked at the customer base, first of all, when we looked at the culture of the company, there's a company that was really a company of peers to its customer base, a company of engineers, a company of developers, a company of innovators and of architects, and the customer base, both within this particular conference and at large, fit the profile as well. We tended not to be providing enterprise, you know, ERP managed hosting for back office systems. We were providing a platform for people who are developing the next wave of internet functionality or providing managed hosting and other services to their customer base, but really a, a company that was very well aligned with its customers. And so what we realized was that we fundamentally created the platform for our customers to provide innovation, to provide the next wave, the next revolution of internet technology. From a positioning standpoint, looking at the market, the other thing we realized was that in a world, again, populated very significantly by folks who are very much concentrating on the enterprise piece. The problems we solve for our customers, by and large, are internet scale problems. They're big data problems. They're global user base problems. They're high bandwidth problems. And so this is what you see in front of you for what it's worth. When we developed that kind of core work, the one thing we did internally, just fairly quickly, which I'll leave you with only because it does a better job of summarizing all this than I just did, uh, was a quick video. And the marketeers amongst you will notice this is a quick in-house job. It was largely our own photographic assets and some stock photography, but we think it did a pretty good job of being kind of our own think different, our own North Star, if you will, in terms of the brand we were going to build. It wasn't intended for external consumption as an ad. It's more an ad-like object that kind of got the message across for us. So I'm going to chance my arm with this. Found the right button, which is a start. It's possible, because what happened at 11 o'clock was that there could be an ear-splitting blast of feedback and then a sub-audible boom that will make your eyes run out of your skull. And I'm going to take the disclaimer as implied. Scientists, 
software analysis. Plant businesses are not alive. They come to us with castles and flat, with infrastructure that bends to their imagination. Where is the line between physical and virtual? Spans the borders between nations. Performance, control, and network of networks are there to on demand, on the fly, on the front line. We can be reflected on the way tomorrow. So it's a little high flown and it's certainly aspirational language, but we thought it did a good job of evangelizing that position of the company, getting the internal team kind of fired up about it, and then gave us a good central reference point for the kind of emotive feeling about what do we mean when we say build the future, right? What's the core kind of ethos of what we're trying to get across? And that's it. Um, any questions? No questions. Any questions at all? Yes? I think the core kind of identity piece almost fell into place to some extent, which is a cheap answer, but it's true. I think that the challenges actually were as we, once we had the kind of build the future idea and the concept and even the video, then it was, okay, how do we take that, which is really highly kind of touchy-feely qualitative, and actually start to build the second order stuff off that. Um, that was where we started to hit kind of the internet scale as really the primary kind of hard functional differentiator. So this is the, 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 the build the future is more the personality, right? The internet scale is kind of the, the fundamental positioning. Um, and it was really about how to keep that consistent all the way through, and I would say that's still evolving. You know, the, the output of this, the brand campaign that, that has been launched here is less than 90 days old. We've got kind of a couple of central creative executions based on it. The trick now is to expand that portfolio, expand the inventory of, of ads, um, and write more detailed kind of copy about the second order stuff and keep it consistent. So that I think the core identity piece was almost, it's, it was, it, the story essentially told itself when we sat back and said, well, who are we actually, who are the customers actually, what, if we cut through the buzzwords, we cut through the boilerplate stuff, what are we actually doing? Some of that stuff was surprisingly easy. I think it was easier, frankly, at soft layer than other processes I've been involved with, perhaps because the company had a very, very firm sense of who it was, knew intrinsically who it was from a culture, from an ethos perspective, which helped a lot. Yes? Not, not in a conventional, not in a highly structured sense. Um, we, said, you know, we, we brought this back because at the end of the day, if 700 people throw up on this, it doesn't matter how stylish it is or even how exciting it is to the outside world, it's, just, it's not going to resonate. So we wanted to make sure that everyone got it and that, you know, in our case, the 12 founders of the company responded very part, said, well, that's us. Well, good, that, you know, that's the point. Um, what we are still in the process of doing is building the functional set of kind of positioning and messaging tools so that we're all on exactly the same hymn book at a trade show, et cetera, et cetera. And some of that's a moving target. And it, it, it's possible to overstructure that and make it sound rote and mechanical which is, I think is a mistake as well. Um, but the short answer is, yeah, there's tools we built just to make sure that everyone knows you know, what it is. The other important thing, I think, is this wasn't a revolution in identity, but more an articulation. So there were no real surprises here at all. And so I think a lot of that work is more about let's get on the same page from a terminology and taxonomy standpoint, as opposed to this is who you are now, remember it. It's a good question. So at the moment, uh, we obviously have presence in Asia and Europe. At the moment, we are largely in areas there where we're doing business in English. We have yet to localize the website. We're selling you know, to a broad international base. 
this messaging, frankly, at this level is high enough and it's resonating fairly well worldwide. As we continue to expand into Asia and Europe, um, those challenges will present themselves. Um, the way I've addressed them in the past is to make sure that we've got marketing people in those territories who understand culturally and linguistically uh, you know, who they're selling to, because there's nothing worse than marketing across the planet in an American accent, right? It's, it's, it, 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 at best, it'll work, and at worst, it's actually rejected. Or, in fact, marketing anywhere in, in, in the wrong voice. You've got to understand who they are uh, and who you're dealing with, where it's appropriate to translate, where it's not appropriate to translate. So we've been kind of, the, the structure of it at the moment has meant those battles are relatively minimal. Uh, internationally, we do have marketing personnel in our major locations just to make sure that everything we do filters through a local prison. Yes? Ah, a member of our board of directors is here. <laughs> um, we are going to measure tactical lead generation in the ways that you would expect, right? And very much in kind of just classic marketing ROI. Um, I've always been a firm believer that you ultimately have to measure this stuff over the long term and, and with a certain amount of inferences, right? I mean, you, you know, you'll, we will measure our hopefully our positioning as a, a leader in developing internet scale cloud infrastructure in the ubiquity of our mentions in the press where those stories are talked about. Um, and that's not something I'm going to apply hard metrics to. It's more you know it when you see it. I think this is more, you could make the argument that this is just foundational. And if we get this right, it will show in the second order metrics. It will show in the ROI from trade shows. It will show in the effectiveness of display advertising in terms of click through. It'll show on the website in terms of abandon rates, in terms of pickup and so forth. I think it's difficult. The, the one thing I would say fairly violently is I've never been a huge proponent at the core brand identity piece of focus grouping it. Um, I think you affect the measurement there by measuring it. You're, especially when you get into kind of the aesthetic stuff, you're asking people to evaluate uh, in a way that they don't evaluate when they're dealing with it just on the street. And so I think that's a place where I'd rather have the intestinal fortitude and the courage of the convictions to go, we think it's right, we as a business think it's right, we think it's differentiated, we think it'll be compelling, and just throw it out there and test it in the real world. All right, thank you very much, appreciate it.